I'm Kirby Davidson, President and CEO for the Graduate School of Banking at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and welcome to today's session that's part of the series of our Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, this is a series of uh, keynote speakers that do a lot of teaching for us here at GSP, along with um, a number of state and national events and are highly sought after speakers. So we're glad to have them as part of our Distinguished Speaker Series this year and to offer this additional complimentary uh, presentation for all of our students in this year's program and the organizations uh, that are sponsoring our students in this year's program. So um, I do want to remind everyone that you are welcome to uh, share this presentation with others at your organization as a thank you uh, for having a student in the program this year. And in addition to thanking the organizations, I also want to thank this year's sponsors of the GSB Distinguished Speaker Series, the Financial Manager Society, Bank Talent HQ, the University of Massachusetts Amherst Eisenberg School of Business, WIPLI, Federal Home Loan Bank of Des Moines, Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago, the University of Nebraska College of Business and their Master of Business Administration and Open Lending. Many of these organizations have been sponsors with GSB for many years and we appreciate their ongoing support. With that, I'm going to introduce and turn it over to today's speaker, Steve Lefevre. Steve is one of the nation's leading advocates in the banking and small business community and a top rated instructor here at the Graduate School of Banking for over two decades. Students consistently comment year after year that Steve provides keen insights and perspectives on how to develop a proactive approach to effectively connect with the most important and profitable market segment, the independent business. In addition, Steve flips things around a bit and discusses what independent businesses are looking for in a bank and how you as bankers can use this knowledge to your advantage. His client list is lengthy. He's a highly sought after speaker at state and national events. And we're so pleased that he's here today and on our faculty here at the Graduate School of Banking at the University of Wisconsin for more than two decades. Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Well, hello. And Kirby, thank you. Uh, appreciate the introduction. And uh, hello, GSB banks and bankers. Steve Lefevre here uh, in a little bit different format than I'm used to presenting, but uh, uh, moving forward nonetheless. Uh, today, what I want to talk about is a few thoughts and insights uh, that I've gathered over the last three decades in terms of as it relates to banks and the independent business community. The last 17 months have been a challenge for all of us, both personally and business-wise, and no one has been challenged more than the independent business community. Uh, that is, I'm referring to businesses with generally less than 50 million in revenue. Uh, once again, as it does every time there's a financial downturn, the lack of financial acumen and planning has reared its ugly head. And once again, as it always has, this disruption has created a wonderful opportunity for those industries that serve the independent business market among the most important, of course, is the banking industry. So let's talk banking the independent business here for a little bit. Uh, while many banks were earning record profits last year, uh, the independent business community um, was really decimated. And uh, I'd like to share some ways that banks can help, that you can help the independent business community based on my experience, a number of my clients and what I see out there in the marketplace. Uh, 
for the business community, we might title the last 17 months, lack of financial acumen meets COVID. And uh, once again, the results have been significantly negative. So here we go. Let's talk the difference between full service and lip service. That's kind of where, where, where we hang our hat, okay? Um, that's me. I'm sure there some of you viewing this have probably sat in on one of my classes over the last, actually, Kirby said more than two decades. I'm, I'm home, homing in on three decades now. Uh, so yeah, maybe you've sat in on my class. I enjoy it. It's one of the highlights of my year because number one, the, or, the organization GSB is so well organized and the students are so interactive and that's not as much happening right now, but we can still communicate the, uh, the, the concepts and the tools. And frankly, money flows through businesses pretty much the same way all around the world, regardless of how it's delivered, okay? So some thoughts here. I wanna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little outline in terms of small business and what the things are that I think you can do, which is help educate them. If you know me at all, you know that I'm a huge advocate of education. And then I'll talk about some of the results. It sounds good, but does it work? And I want to share with you some of the results that we've seen. But I'm going to also give you some insights into some of the educational things that you can provide to the business community, all right? So if there's two people involved in a business, traditionally, as you know, one person knows how to make it and one person knows how to what? And I suspect some of you who are sitting, sitting there viewing this in your mind, at least lip synced, um, spend it, which is not the right answer. That would, be, um, that would be a different approach. Making it and selling it is what independent business owners do well, right? That's what they do well. The financial side, which is your world, is often left to the accountant, the banker, the, uh, let's see, spouse is what I used to say, right? Spouse or no one. I had people say, well, we just hope it works. Well, over the last 17 months, a lot of it didn't work. And those companies that went into the beginning of COVID with challenges and with either a weak P&L and or a weak balance sheet likely didn't come out. And yet it happens every time, go back to 2008, nine. And one of the things I advocate for is building financial acumen in good times as well as bad times. The other thing I'm gonna to touch on is we see a lot of information now that says we're coming out of the uh, recession, if you wanna call it that, or the pandemic cycle. Um, it's just as dangerous coming out as going in, in terms of survivability of the business community for a few different reasons that I'll highlight today, okay? So that's the picture. Um, what I want to do is just give you a little quiz that you can take internally. I can't do a uh, polling slide because this is an archive session, but you can stop it and do a quick polling slide. How many of your customers, if you, if you queried all of your business customers from the very largest to the very smallest, how many of them could answer? The fixed costs are 144,000 in this hypothetical business. The variable cost percentage is 70 and the target profit is 60,000. And I have two questions. One, how much do you need in sales with these metrics? And secondly, how much in sales do you need if fixed costs go up a dollar? And what I'd like to do is just you answer the question, 
what percentage of your business customers could answer this, these two questions, which are relatively straightforward, if you understand the financial tools, they're pretty straightforward. What percentage of your customers could answer? I've done this, and when we get a little bit farther into the presentation this morning, of course, I'll answer them. But secondly, I will tell you about my experiences at a bank out here in the Pacific Northwest. So just write down a number. If there's more than one of you viewing this, both of you, just pause it and write down a number on your piece of paper and then compare it, all right? As it turns out, if the percentage is small, this is not a problem as many of my colleagues at the bank when I worked there said, this is an opportunity, an opportunity to educate them. All right. So once upon a time, there was a faculty member, some of you who went to uh, GSB, attended GSB some years ago, probably had a class from him. Jim Donnelly was a terrific guy. Uh, he was on the, a professor of marketing at the University of Kentucky. And what he said, I always sat in on his classes when I wasn't teaching because he was one of the best out there. Uh, the market-driven business seeks to meet the current and emerging needs of the markets it serves by developing and implementing solutions that are innovative, flexible, and scalable. Something you can bring to your entire customer base. And that's where I want to talk about what the banks we've worked with have done, okay? Wonderful solution. And of course, innovation over the last 17 months has been a huge thing. We've done things, many of us, fat, much faster than we ever could have imagined that we could do it. It's amazing what you can do when you have to, isn't it? All right. Uh, accounting firms also serve the independent business. And in working with a, a, a medium-sized regional firm down in Florida, they saw firsthand the client relationship building. We always talk about relationship banking. And if you educate your customers, that builds a relationship that is rock solid. And uh, one of the senior partners here at, uh, at James Moore basically said, he, as you know, a CPA attends thousands of hours of CPE. And he, uh, he never sat through a class that did this for him before, that kept his attention the whole two days. Anyway, um, I want to talk about the challenges and opportunities of working together and, and just a little, little background. Seattle First National Bank is where I came from. A little background on them. And then I want to talk about the profile, opportunities and benefits. This is just my outline. Challenges of the market. Do we know our customers? Do we really know what our customers know and what they need and what they're, what they're challenged by? Who's the competition? Most important, creating real market differentiation. Of course, we've seen that everybody says, we wanna be different. We wanna be different. As it turns out, very few are. And so I just wanna talk about my experiences in that regard. Identify needs, help the customer become a better business owner. That's at the, that's at the, uh, at the center of what I believe the opportunity is, okay? Uh, matching products and services to needs, all right? And does it work? I want to give you a few examples of banks that we have worked with besides Seattle First that have really taken this to a level that makes it work as opposed to just a lip service kind of experiment. And can you deliver? Making it happen. It has to be a decision that management makes. So, just a little bit on the C Seattle First uh, story. Uh, I worked at Seattle First. I went to Seattle First in the, in the mid 1970s. I know that's a long time ago. Um, interestingly enough though, the principles of finance are still the same and the challenges in the independent business community are still the same. So the opportunity we saw is still there in spades as it turns out after COVID. So, um, I went there in, 19, in the 19, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, my master's thesis was a business development plan 
for uh, for a bank. Seafirst was my my target, my host. Um, I signed an NDA and uh, uh, gave them my report when I was finished. It says, and the title was, in addition to money, how can banks help businesses? And my, if you looked at the, it was about yay thick to pass the weight test, but if you looked at the executive summary, it basically said, educate them. Educate them on how money flows through a business because most business owners, and I know because I was a business owner before I got there, I ran a small business and built it up and finally sold it to my banker, went back and got an MBA in finance because I couldn't read a financial statement. And I thought I was the only one. And when I got to the bank, I discovered by guard, by golly, I wasn't the only one. So um, we had a hard time because just a quick story, because it, it still puts things in perspective for me. I was still a newbie at the bank and, and we have uh, Washington Husky football up here and, and somebody who has to run the, uh, the tailgate program. So I was the guy picked to do it because I was the newest on the totem pole. I was there with my paper name tag. And uh, this gentleman walks up to me, older gentleman, and he said, Steve Lefever, with had my name on it. Um, he said, what do you do at the bank? And I said, oh, pretty much anything they want me to. He said, how long have you been there? I said, about six months. He said, uh, uh, what do you think? And I said, well, good. He said, do you have any ideas? And I said, yeah, I think we ought to... Uh, I think we ought to educate our business customers and put a program together. And he said, why do you think that? And I said, well, when I ran my business, I didn't really understand the financials and I had no idea what the balance sheet was all about. And I had brought this idea up to my supervisor at the bank about a mm, month and a half, two months before he went to a supervisor meeting. He came back and said, we've looked at your idea and we think it's stupid. So I, uh, I had a, I had a response. It, it wasn't all that great in many ways, but uh, now this gentleman said, why do you think that? And I said, because there's a whole lot of business owners like me. Anyway, it happened very quickly. He said, I got to go to the game. I said, great, so do I. Um, and I said, but, but before you leave, uh, what do you do? You know what I do, what do you do? And he said, oh, I work at the bank too. I said, really, what do you do? And he said, I'm the vice chairman. I said, golly, it's, you're probably at a higher floor than me. At any rate, two weeks later, my boss comes back to me and says, Steve, we've been thinking about your idea. And we think it's, we, we do think it's a good idea. That's how the program got started. I, I turned out that uh, when the top guy likes it, apparently uh, uh, it flows downhill, doesn't it? At any rate, we put it together and we started teaching our business customers, charging them, which again was a challenge. A million and a half business owners later, we, increased our market share in the Pacific Northwest by five percentage points. Not solely because of that, but it was a big piece, okay? 20,000 bankers over the years have attended this program, 20,000 CPAs, we use this, okay? Three continents, eight languages, we presented this program. So it gets around. Some of you who are watching this probably were in my class at GSB since I've been there for almost three decades. The goal was to improve financial acumen. You'll hear this a couple of times, help owners become better business people and make better business decisions. So let's talk about small business. 25 million of them out there, there's a lot, right? 52% of the workforce roughly, 75% of new jobs, and we need new jobs, right? And 51% uh, of the private sector GDP, more than 55% of the innovations come from small business. So all I'm suggesting is there's a great opportunity there. And how can you connect with them? By educating them and doing it well in a way that is fun, in a way that is intuitive, in a way that is linear, all right? Opportunities, small businesses and their employees have needs across every segment of your bank's services. Every segment, 60% or more are estimated now to transition to another bank or another service over the next 10 years. So you've got a great opportunity if you put forth an, a, a program, some kind of a way of connecting 
that attracts them. And to do that, you gotta look at what? Their pain points, right? You gotta look at their pain points. And I will tell you again, their pain point is education. Uh, for your customers, the market challenges, very simple. They know how to make and sell it, but the financial side is a bit of a mystery. We already talked about that, right? Oftentimes lack management skills, high failure rate, high failure rate. I'll tell you in a minute about what the first fellow, uh, my first colleague at Seafirst when I was in my management development class, what he said when he walked into the room, high failure rate. 70 to 80% within the first 10 years, right? High administrative costs relative to the amount of, of capital, but are there other services that you could use? Like banks experiencing challenges from non-traditional competitors. And of course, banks have that same issue. Significant transition rate in the coming decade, a lot of older businesses will leave or the owners at least will leave. Will they survive the transition? Transition planning and the exercise of that, big opportunity. For your bank, higher handling costs than with big business. Not putting all your capital in one bucket, right? Bigger loans to bigger businesses. If there are challenges, bigger issues. So. How can we deal with the smaller loans in a way that is profitable and effective? High risk, they are a higher risk. Uh, lower borrowing and depository relationships. Cash flow is a big issue for most small businesses and most emerging businesses for sure. Higher cost of account acquisition. How do you find them? Well, we answered that question. We helped them find us. We helped them find us. That's what we did at Seafirst. And that's what the banks that I've, I've worked with have done. Okay, so the uh, bank board, a, uh, a, a research organization out of the DC area. Everyone seems to complain about the lack of differentiation. There's where banks fit, right between soap and bottled water. More similar. They're less differentiated than soap. To me, that is a challenge. How do we, how do we address that? And again, I believe the answer is education. And what many of you are going to be thinking is, well, everybody can put on programs. There's just about everything out there that you do can be successful. The question is, how do you make it successful? Do you organize it? Do you commit to it? Do you do it well? That's the key. Doing it well, something that's scalable, doing it over and over. Jim Donnelly's approach. Innovative, flexible, and scalable. All right. Here's the answer that most people come up with. The only way to differentiate is on service. I say no. I say no. The ability to introduce new products and services. It may only be 5% of what people believe, but if you find the right approach, that's where you can create an awareness, create a brand. Here was a quote from that uh, bank board report. We have an undifferentiated product. We have no price power. We have to differentiate on service. I don't agree with that because everyone says they have great service. You have to ask the customer what they think, but I do think there's an alternative and it's education. All right. Who's the competition? Well, there's a lot of competition out there, isn't it? You know who all the competition is. So non-financial sources, big banks, small banks, accounting firms, online now, 
lots of different um, competitive alternatives. So you have to come up with something that you can leverage that's different, that's unique, and that's effective and meets the needs. I still claim it's education. So how do we create real market differentiation? That's, I guess, the question that everyone would ask if they were asking the right questions. So let me talk about that a little bit. It's all about helping the customer become a better business owner. And to do that, you have to understand their weak points, understanding why they fail. Here's the basic approach that we have seen and the clients that the, the business, the banks that we've worked with over the years have come up with. Planning, failure to plan at the beginning, kind of a jump and hope approach. Monitor financial position. Businesses do not track their performance. They do not track their performance mostly because they don't know how. And it's not hard. You know, and you can teach them, but it has to be taught in a way that is a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? Sort of the Mary Poppins approach. Understand the relationship between price, volume, and cost. Everyone knows their costs, right? Unless you didn't answer that second slide I had, depending on how many business, what percentage of your business customers could answer that question. We'll answer it here in just a few minutes. Manage cash flow. Is it possible to have net profits and no money? Of course, patterns, patterns of cash flow. Manage growth. This is where we know going into a recession, everyone in the business community says that's going to be a challenge. And many businesses were not prepared and did go away. What they don't recognize is that coming out of a recession is just as challenging in terms of cash flow, but in some different ways, as I'll talk about in just a few minutes. We see almost as many failures coming out of a recession as we do going in, but for different reasons. All of them, though, revolve around financial issues. Borrow properly. Do business owners know how to borrow money? Can they answer two questions? How much and how long? Most commonly from the get-go, business owners get those two wrong. They don't borrow enough and they don't ask for enough time to repay. And we can help with that. The metrics here will help them. And plan for transition. Think about getting in, getting up, getting out. Of course, if you don't do one through six correctly, don't need seven, do you? Okay, so in the, in the programming that we've done for banks, we focus on four key tools. And I'm just going to review them briefly for you. I'm not going to try to teach them. I'm just going to show you what's possible. Some of you who have sat through my program at GSB, my course, you, want, you know this, but those four areas, right? Monitor financial position using ratios. Understand the relationship between price, volume, and cost. Understand break even. The most important PL tool of all. Managing cash flow short term. There are so many businesses and business owners and managers who have never actually physically done a cash flow. They haven't had the aha moment. Manage growth. And that's what we're talking about now in this potentially post-pandemic uh, cycle where we hear that there's a tremendous pent-up demand across really the world, but we're speaking generally of the U.S. economy. But as revenues rise, which would drive revenues up, but as revenues rise, we got to be able to provide the assets to support that. And if we've got businesses that have been weakened by the pandemic, will they be able to do that? Okay, so improve financial acumen. That's what, that's what I believe the answer, the opportunity really is. Taking an amazing journey inside the numbers. And I'm just gonna give you some insights into that over the next few minutes, okay? 
uh, unlock the secrets of their numbers. There's a whole story inside those two documents, a balance sheet and an income statement. Business owners don't appreciate it. It's kind of like they don't know it exists and you can help them know it exists because it's really financial intelligence. It's kind of like giving a small child a book. I'm sure you've done that where they open it and the characters pop up. If we've got the right set of tools, those four things we just talked about, ratios, break even, cash flow, and uh, balance sheet management, they will bring those numbers up and put them in perspective for us. What I tell business owners always, because I speak to a lot of business groups, more business groups than bank groups. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. And today it's more important than ever. And this, what I'm going to lay out for you can help you help your customers. And if your customers find their numbers boring, huh, they got the wrong numbers. I remember the first business owner I ever called on at the bank with, after I went through training and they sent me out on the street. I said, you know, I've been looking at your business and this ties to that, that causes that, and that ties to that. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that might be true, but my business is what? You've heard it, different, right? My business is different. Well, they're all different in the very same ways. These tools have worked for years and they still work. That's the thing. Technology changes rapidly, but the principles of how money flows through a business, they've been the same for the last, I don't know how long, and they'll be the same in a hundred years. And once people got it, they got it. And it doesn't matter whether it's manufacturer, wholesaler, retail service business. What I'm gonna lay out for you in just a brief overview will address any business. All right, so my, uh, my word for the process, we call it profit mastery, my word for the process, measure. What gets measured gets managed and what gets managed gets done, but you gotta know how to measure it. And that's what I'm gonna outline here. When I said measure to my customers, you gotta measure, they said, measure what? And I said, well, the key drivers. And they said, cool, the key drivers of what? And I said, well, two things, NP, net profit, and CF, cash flow, right? And that's one of those myths out there. There's about a half a dozen myths that I think also got to be busted. And that is, if we have profits, we'll surely have cash. Way too many people believe that. Put an umbrella over this and say, you got to measure performance. It's as simple as that. So we put together a process at the bank at, C at C-First, and I still use it. How many legs on the stool? Three, right? Take a leg away, stool falls over. Financial performance is a three-legged stool. Education is the foundation. That's where it starts. If you don't do that piece, none of the others work that well. Benchmarking, you know about RMA. That's the yardstick. And what do they say? What is the contractor's mantra? Measure twice, cut once. And accountability. Got to have some kind of accountability. We met with our customers and their CPAs quarterly, four times a year, using the tools I'm about to lay out. All right. Now, help your customers understand and manage their financial operating cycle. I'm going to build it right here for you. And by the way, I came up with a concept some years ago. Every module, those seven modules that I shared with you a few moments ago, every module has a picture. Visual finance, three ways to communicate out there. Fin finance is the medium, but communication is the message, right? And I see three ways to communicate, numbers, words, and pictures. Well, everybody'd agree that numbers, finance is numbers. That's the hardest way for most business owners. The easiest way, pictures, visual finance. So every module you're gonna see has some visuals in it that you can use to communicate better with your customers. The owners and the creditors put up the money to buy the assets. And of course, you know that is the balance sheet. We own assets to create sales. That linkage right there is the most important. 
and sales to create a profit, right? That's the income statement. Now we've made a profit at the end of the at the end of the year or whenever the term is. What you want to do, what your customers want to do is hide it. They can run, but they can't hide. So they pay some tax and the three uses of profits, which most business owners are not aware. Reinvest, repay debt and take it home. I didn't number them because they provide the priority, not me. If I put one, two, three, all of a sudden that becomes a priority and that's not it. Okay, we need enough profits to do which of these three in the long run? And the answer is all three. And what drives this cycle? Efficiency, right? I talked about the difference between profit and cash flow. We got to measure two of them, two cycles, profit cycle, cash cycle, right? They overlap a little in some businesses, a lot in others, but they're two distinct cycles with two distinct sets of drivers. Where do we find profits? Over on the income statement. Where do we find cash flow? On the balance sheet. The whole training process of helping business owners become better business owners is right there in that picture. That's a picture of any business anywhere. All right. So just want to do three or four slides with monitor financial position using ratios. You know this stuff. You know this stuff. A balance sheet and an income statement. The entire, all four of those tools can be addressed with just those two pieces of paper. We just got to go inside and think of them as 3D, right? Three-dimensional, because there's a story in there. And most people just skim across the surface. But we have a report card, just like we used to get in school, right? You've done this before. We have a report card, three years, right? 14 ratios or eight or 12 or 16 or whatever you need. Industry, that's RMA, you know our risk management associates. We fill it in. Now you hand that to a business owner and they're just gonna give you a blank look. So we gotta make it visual, right? We gotta teach them how these things work together and make it visual. You make it visual by saying, Inventory turns, you're getting 4.2, the industry's getting 4.9. Did you know you were out around by seven tenths of a turn? It's still, it's still numbers. So we got to convert numbers. And of course that's the RMA page. We taught customers how to use the RMA page. You print that out or take a photocopy out of an RMA book or out of the RMA um, online and hand it to a customer, doesn't mean anything. Make it mean something. All right, <laughs> built this roadmap. This roadmap is probably the most valuable tool that business owners get. Three key symptoms, right? Lower declining cash, lower declining margin, lower declining profits. In the direction of the arrow, right? Causes, the word causes against the arrow is caused by. Once you teach somebody how to read this cycle, it's really simple. And what we did is we took and we did all the blue is profit issues where we populate, he's out around by $80,000 on his margin. There they are, right? There they are, total up to 80. And on his cash, inventory, receivables, and does he have his loan structured properly? So here's what this does. It answers three things. Locate the leak, because we're talking about leaks, comparing him with his peers. Locate the leak, quantify the leak, and how many dollars, and identify the leak. Is it a profit or a cash leak? Blue profit, red, you color code it for people. Make it simple. And then you summarize it for him. Comparing you to your peers, here's your opportunity. Like that. And you can also automate this. We automated it so you can print it out of QuickBooks or any other accounting package. So it does not like that, but we got to teach them how to, how to understand what's happening. Okay, then understand the relationship between price, volume, and cost. Not hard, not hard. Here we go. Sales visual, 
fall into the variable cost cap, right? And what's not variable trickles down into the fixed cost cup. And once that happens, my fixed cost cup, when that's full, my cup runneth over and it flows down to become what? Profit. I tell business owners, this is the visual p &L. You can use this for every operating decision you make, bar none, okay? Pretty simple. The key to break even is know your costs so you can effectively react to changes. Live in a dynamic world, price, volume, and cost. What type of questions can we answer? If you cut or add a fixed cost, if you have a profit goal, you work the financial operating cycle that I just talked about backwards and get to a needed sales. If I hire a new person, probably the most common, I'm gonna pay somebody $60,000 all up, FUCA, FICA, FIPA, all that. What do I need in sales to cover it? Way too often, the answer is $60,000. And in most businesses, as you know, that won't even come close. But we can take a look at the PL and tell them exactly based on the efficiency of their PL how it's going to work. You'll see that in just a minute. How can I evaluate the impact of additional expenses caused by COVID or any other disruption, right? Four steps variable and fixed, take a normal PL, determine variable cost as a percent of sales, determine the contribution margin. Oh my gosh, it's so important. It's so important. We once did an entire two-day session for Pepsi-Cola nationally just on that phrase. That's all they used as a management tool. And calculate break-even in dollars or units if you have a homogeneous product, right? Traditional revenue, variable. They're parallel. They go up and down together, right? Sales cause variable costs. Fixed cost, a stair step function. You have them whether you have sales or not. Probably the most important slide accountants PL, we know that sales minus cost of goods sold leaves a gross profit minus operating expenses. Leaves a net profit, which at break even is zero. Yeah. Now we're going to. We're going to change it around. We're going to make a managerial PL. To the cost of goods, we're going to add all the variable operating expenses like commissions, right? Call those variable. What's left will be the fixed operating expenses, right? So out of every, my contribution margin is basically what's left when all the variable costs go away to provide for cover the fixed costs and provide for profit. People always forget profit. But we're going to see that in just a minute, right? Understand the relationship. Here it is. We did it. I did it again in case you didn't get it the first time. You can make a, I, I tell business owners, make a video. I make, make a copy of this. Use it with every operating decision you make. My example, let's do the example that I was my third slide, okay? I asked what percentage of business owners could answer that. Just so you know, I did that. I gave out to 2,000 business owners. I gave that little quiz. I just printed out the page and I gave it and said, can you answer these two questions? Variable cost 70, fixed cost 144, target profit 60. That's my hypothetical business. Questions, what sales do I need with that profile? And if fixed costs go up a dollar, what do I need in sales? You know what percentage business owners could answer out of the 2,000 business owners we gave it out to just as a survey? 15%. That means 85% of business owners didn't know how to use a PL. There's nothing wrong with being uneducated, and your opportunity is don't let them continue. Educate them. All of my colleagues at the bank initially said, oh my gosh, that's, an that's a major problem. And I said, no, that's a major opportunity. We're going to educate them how to use this. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna build a P&L. Sales, variable cost is 70%. Contribution out of every dollar is 30. Fixed cost is 144. Target profit is 60. We treat target profit as a fixed cost, a cost of capital, if you will. So my bogey, 
is 204,000. How many 30 cents is in 204? 680. 680. Every business owner should do that like that. Fixed costs go up a dollar. We divide the same 30 cents into a dollar and get 333. Now that's an incredibly important number. This says when fixed costs go up a dollar, he's got to get $3.33 in sales to cover it. So that $60,000 employee that I mentioned a few minutes ago, we've got to get a, over 190,000 in sales before that employee is an asset to the company rather than a liability. People got to know that. The other thing they got to know is they got to track that number. Managerially, which way would you like that number to go? You want it to go down, but you got to force it down. If you don't pay any attention to it, which way will it go? Unmanaged, it will go up. And then it makes your job harder. You're working harder, not smarter. That's your magic number. Every business has a magic number. I believe that there are more people that know their sleep number than their magic number, if they're business owners. And if they don't know their magic number, then they may not get a lot of sleep, all right? Okay, so cash flow. Myths, if we, have, if we have profit, we will surely have cash. Not true at all. Two cycles, all right. Wait a minute, let me go back. If sales go up, cash will go up. This depends on the patterns. So I have people do a cash flow, a cash flow projection, a little case study. And then we graph three lines, sales, profits, and cash. And the goal, there's 360 numbers there. It's kind of mind boggling. So we do a picture, sales, Profits, cash. Now, it's pretty hard to refute that there's a difference between profits and cash because the lines don't look anything like the other. And we know what drives the profit line? Sales, cost of goods sold, and operating expenses. What drives the cash line? Working capital, that's inventory and AR, fixed assets, and about 15% impact of profitability. Which one do we have to ma ma manage? Which cycle? Both of them. Both of them. All right. Questions. How can he repay in this little case study $220,000 in short-term debt with only $43,000 in profits? What's the answer? It's not profits that repay short-term debt. It's what? Cash flow repays short-term debt. We need profits to repay what kind of debt? Long-term, understanding the impact of patterns, and then understanding the opportunities of sensitivity analysis. Change the things that drive cash on the balance sheet, inventory and receivables. In my little case study, I projected a 60 day collection cycle. The biggest number on line 29, which was cumulative borrowing was 220 and the ending cash out in November at the end of the year was 7,400. And then I redid it with a 45 day collection period, two weeks, 135 max borrowing, ending cash 50. And then I said one more time with feeling, 30 day collection period, you only borrow 75 and you have 93. Go from 60 to 30 days is an improvement of 30 days. To go from 7,000 to 93,000 is an improvement in cash of 86,000. I round it to 90. 30 days, $90,000. One day is worth three grand. Every day you can reel it in. But every business has a number like that. People ought to know it, right? And my customer says to me, well, Steve, our industry is at 42 days. I can't go to 30. And I said, I agree, because terms is one of the selling elements, right? The element of the elements of the sale process. But you're at 60. Who do you get when you give more credit than everybody else? Deadbeats. So get from 60 to 42, an improvement of 18 days. Well, shoot, if one day is 3,000, 18 days is 54,000. That's 54,000 that they don't need to borrow. The message I always send to business owners, banks wanna loan you money to help you grow. 
They do not want to loan you money to subsidize your inefficiencies. Simple as that. Here's what somebody, here's what we learned in the in the in the past 17 months. Here's what people think is most important. Sales is the most important. Of course it is. Profits and then oh yeah, cash flow. And then what did we learn? We learned. And so many businesses learned this in the last 17 months. You can afford decreased profits if you have cash flow, but the converse is not true. It's all about cash flow. So the new financial education life cycle, sales three, profits two, and balance sheet cash one. Cash is king. Here's the way I say it. Sales are vanity. You get to brag about them. Profits are sanity. And cash flow is king. And that's what Every time we have a downturn, we have to learn it again. Why don't we just keep learning it? All right. My favorite module. Just take a little bit and go through it. And then we'll kind of, um, I want to give you a couple examples of companies that have used this process. Go all the way back to the financial operating cycle, right? The owners and the creditors put up the money to buy the assets. And that's the balance sheet. We own assets to create sales. And the financial operating cycle, as you can see, the little arrows, it goes counterclockwise. Now we're going to talk about, as I said, post-pandemic, we expect sales to rise. So let's go the other way. Sales going up causes a need for what? More assets, which causes a need for sources of money to buy the assets, right? That linkage, sales cause a need for assets, which causes a need for sources of money to buy the assets that lives in the house that Jack built. Right, It works its way all the way back to sources of money to grow, and there's only four. There they are. You, the bank, profit, unless they strip it all out to minimize their tax. And I say, that's not a good idea if you're trying to grow a business. New equity. There's tons of equity out there. Find a sugar daddy, if you will. Trade credit. This is one that's overlooked a lot, in my opinion. If, I've got a, if I'm selling a lot for a particular supplier, and that company is well financed, I can go to them and say, here's my plan. Use all these tools we just went through and help me. Give, instead of 30 days, give me 60 days. Giving me access to credit is just like giving me capital, right? And we did a little financial gap, financial gap, right? The difference between the money you got and the money you need. Very sophisticated tool. Put into plain English, I worked real hard on this for a number of years, right? We had 900,000 in sales and we said down over on the PL, we got sales and sales cause a need for more assets at some level of efficiency. Yes. So we go down the left hand side, buying the assets. We go across and we go up the right hand side, paying for them. It's as simple as that. And the very last entry is you, right? And the less well they do these other things, the bigger is that number. And then you end up loaning them money to subsidize their inefficiencies, which is just what you didn't want to do. We want them to wear a cap that says asset manager or balance sheet manager, right? Follow the yellow brick road. This is my shout out to the Wizard of Oz, okay? So now we started at 600 in my little case. You're not going through it. Some of you did over the past years. He had no financial gap. Then we went to 900,000 and doing this process, he ended up with 126,000, right? And when we calculate the balance sheet ratios, what do we find? He's a bigger in the sales, weaker on his balance sheet company. Bad company? No, but weaker. Then he says, oh, let's go for it. Let's do a million six in sales. Then we get a humongous number. And when we Calculate the balance sheet ratios. Oh my gosh. His current ratio is, is 0.94. He's functionally insolvent. For every dollar going out, he's only got 94 cents coming in. And he's got almost, for every dollar he has in the business, the, the creditors have almost three. Bigger, weaker company. This is what I'm talking about post-pandemic. Growing broke. Sales go up. We're coming out, there's pent up demand, assets. I gotta buy assets to support the sales. I gotta have cash to do it. And if I don't, I borrow money, that framework. So in my little case study, 
sales go from 600 to a million six. Assets go from 558 to a million 288. Trust me on these numbers, okay? Which means use of cash. An increase in an asset is a use of cash. I need $730,000 of sources of money. Well, I made 3% net profit after tax on a million six. That's 48, right? But that's nowhere near. So other sources. My payables went from 90 to 240. We're getting more credit from our, our uh, suppliers, right? I mean, our, our, our customers, um, 150 accruals, heat, lights, water, sewer, garbage. But the big one, line of credit, that's you, zero to 462. 682, well, that's closer. Those are all debt sources. Add in the 48 of equity and that gets us to 730. Where's the rub? The rub is if we look at the mixture of debt and equity in the growth piece, right? He's got 682 of debt, 48 of equity, 14.2 to one. He will in fact grow broke. And this is, this is the challenge coming out of the recession for the next year, especially companies who haven't managed their balance sheet going in or during, they will run into problems and you gotta know that. All right, if you don't like what you see, here's my 10 point sponge checklist. My analogy is pretty simple. A sponge soaks up water, you get it out by squeezing it. What does a balance sheet soak up in a growing and or poorly managed company? cash. How do you get it out? Squeeze it. Be more efficient. Here's my 10 point checklist. I just took two of them and gave people an example, right? Inventory and receivables, working capital in other words, right? And structuring the debt properly. And I said, here's my 600,000. You don't remember it, but just a few minutes ago, it was 126 when I had 900,000 in sales. That was my gap. We go to manage it better. We manage the inventory and the receivables, restructure the debt and bingo, we come out with no note payable. And when we calculate the ratios, 900 and 900 managed, no contest. Here he is 50% bigger and yet his ability to pay bills is even better. Here he is 50% bigger in sales, his ability to generate cash is better and his financial risk, these are the first three ratios way back in module two, that's that report card. It's only incrementally greater. Borrow properly, message. Here's what I tell business owners and it's okay to tell them this, borrowing is a privilege, not a right. You have to, as John Hausman used to say in his ad, you have to earn it. Know your number, even more importantly today, given where the banking industry is, Banks got a lot of money. The banking industry is relatively liquid right now as opposed to 2008 and nine. What are you looking for? You're kind of like the Marine Corps. You're looking for a few good borrowers, right? You're looking for a few good borrowers. And when you find them, everybody else finds them too. And then everybody gets into a bidding war. You gotta have something besides price. Otherwise you're a commodity. You know that, that's the, that's the wrap on the banking industry. I believe education, like we're talking about here, takes you out of the commodity mode. Just, this should be a henna tattoo. Every lender, every borrower, where is it? What kind of asset are you buying? How are you gonna finance it? How are you gonna pay it back? Another visual, fixed assets, use long-term debt or equity. And if it's debt, you pay it off out of profits if it's more than a year. Permanent working capital, inventory and receivables, three to five years, or get your vendors to help you. And if it's more than a year, pay it off out of profit. And then true seasonality, line of credit paid off out of cash flow. Potentially three different kinds of debt. Loan package, how much do you need? This will help you get it right. What will you do with it? When will you pay it back? This will help you get that figured out. How will you pay it back? Is it going to come out of net profits or cash flow? Number five, that's the one that a whole lot of companies in March of 2020 didn't have. They didn't have a plan B. And if they didn't have a plan B, we probably don't see them anymore. That's pretty simple, isn't it? 
the roadmap, ratio analysis. That was module two, historically, the past, where have you been? Then we said, break even, variable cost, fixed cost, target profit. That's the present. Then we said, that'll give me the needed sales. Once I know the needed sales to meet a certain target profit with my cost structure, I take off my finance hat, put on my marketing hat, because a lot of us wear more than one hat, and I do a marketing plan. I want to stay in business so I don't run out of money. So I do, in number four, I do a cash flow. And then this one, I import the needed sales from my PL analysis into a gap analysis to see if I'm going to need cash. And if I do, then I have to go to the bank. And that's what we just talked about. But in the interim, I do the sponge, I go through the sponge technique checklist to see if there's any way to reduce my need to borrow. And if you do this really long time, 10, 15, 20 years, what can you do? You can die, but you gotta have a plan. And that's where the trans, uh, a transition, exit strategies, transition, uh, valuation, all those things come in. So now, why doesn't it happen? Here's what I've been told. People said, I don't have time. This was a gentleman, we actually loaned $3 million. He said, I don't have time to do this. We thought, wow, we don't have time to loan it to you. Give it back. And then we discovered a horrid thing. Can't get it back. Don't know how. Baloney. Business owners are smart people if we teach them. If we got good tools. It was important my accountant would do it. Great opportunity for the accounting profession. They don't seem to be picking up on it. There's two or three accounting firms around the country that do this really well. I know because I've worked with them. It's not fun. I happen to think this is fun. This is a great, this is really fun. You're more of a crisis manager. And I thought, I remember hearing that and saying, well, that's a good thing, brother, because you got one. So swing into gear. You ought to be at the top of your game. You're in deep kimchi. There you are, right? As you can see, that particular management position leaves a significant portion of your anatomy exposed. If you don't wanna be there, use the tools of finance. Sounds good, but does it work? I just wanna spend a few minutes and give you some examples. Westpac is the largest bank in Australia. I worked with them from 1997 to 2008. We brought this process to them. No one had ever done anything like this before. Here's what John, John, by the way, is still a personal friend of mine. He's not with Westpac anymore, but here's what he had to say at the time. Response from the Australian business community and our own business banking staff has been nothing short of overwhelming. And they actually measured it. They did what all the marketing people asked me, if you can measure education. Here's what they did. They measured it. They took 10,000 business owners who took this course and they measured them on the key bank profit drivers. There's the graph. Red is profit mastery participants, blue is not. Total account exposure, products and services, loans, only a few more loans because they manage their cash so much better. But look at the impact in deposits. Funny story. So this was a while ago, 2007. I was sitting on my back porch here in Seattle at about four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that's about nine o'clock in the morning on Monday in Sydney. This was Sunday afternoon. We were getting ready to do a barbecue. My phone rang. It was my contacts at Westpac and they said, hey, we just uh, did some checking on, uh, we've, been, we've been doing some surveys to build this thing. And he said, uh, we, uh, we also heard that you were talking to National Australia Bank or, uh, or the Commonwealth, which I wasn't, but they said, we, uh, we, want, to, we want to buy this from you, this, this process, uh, uh, because we don't want anybody else to have it. And I said, it's not for sale. Then they said a number, and then it was. <laughs> At any rate, anybody can use this. CIBC up in Canada, they used it in a very interesting way. We had about 5,000 of their customers attend and all their bankers over the course of about four, five years. And what they did is they did a survey and didn't tell us about it. Information is used extensively, strongly endorsed. All of the attendees would recommend it. Substantially increased understanding. Better business owners. 
seminar cost improved company efficiency. They measured it. This is the thing that ought to be enthusiastic to everyone, enthuse everyone. Um, a sizable proportion of the attendees indicated CIBC has prompted them to meet with a CIBC account manager, whether they were CIBC customers or not. 31% and to obtain a line of credit, 24%. And interestingly enough, with this bank and with the bank in Australia, the customers paid for the program. They paid for a program that then grew their bank. How much better does it get? Uh, just, a, just a response from a very nice gentleman about a $10 million company in, in um, Hawaii that, I, that sat in on a session I did. And he didn't want to go. His CEO made him go. And when he showed up, you could tell from his facial expression he didn't want to go. And we've now become friends. So just, just to tell you, if you do it right, you can take an idea that everybody thinks is generic and you can customize it. You can make it yours. You can build a brand. Can we deliver? Just finishing up now, pull the process together. If you don't have senior support, you got nothing. Top guy, remember the top guy at Seafirst? He didn't like it. This wouldn't exist. I wouldn't have been at the Graduate School of Banking for the last almost three decades. Got to be in the got to be in a, there's got to be a mission statement that says, here's what we're going to try to do. We're going to go beyond just educating business owners, but that's how we earn the right to bring them on as customers or keep them. Smart goals, you know those, specific, measurable, attainable, results-oriented, and time-specific. Then you got to explain it right. When the top guy says, we want this to happen, when Bob Joss, who was worked a senior person at, uh, at um, uh, just went blank, Wells Fargo in San Francisco, he became the CEO of Westpac at a time when Westpac had some trouble in the end of the 90s. I was there teaching the very first night that he showed up and he was flying around Australia, meeting with all the management and employees, telling them how the bank was going to change. And the rest of the people in the bank, except for one gentleman in Western Australia, had said to me, this is worthless. We don't want it. Bob Josh showed up. My contact, had, I had just done a program where they brought in 150 business owners who paid for it. My contact picked up Mr. Joss at the airport. By the way, Bob Joss later became the head of uh, the MBA program, uh, uh, Stanford Business School. At any rate, um, and he was telling him about it from the airport to the meeting. And at the meeting, Bob Joss said, we need to do more things like working with this guy, Lefevre, from, uh, from the US to help our business customers be better. We need to do more of that. And within two weeks, I got contacts from all of the regions of Westpac Bank in Australia saying, well, maybe we, we've rethought it. <laughs> kind of like that's how it happens at any rate. Um, Got to know how risk and cost are addressed. You got to price it appropriately, of course, but it can make sense. You just figure how many of your, how many businesses are on your commercial DDA list? We wanted to get all of them. We had 20,000 business owners attend this program at Seafirst when I was there. Actionable implementation. Staff's got to be behind it after the top people are. We had, we had all the staff sit in on the program first in a, longer version than what you did. And some of you who went to GSB and maybe sat in on my program longer than that. Have all staff participate, follow up. The program opens the door for the customer. If you don't follow up, they're not gonna call you, you follow up. That's how you get in. What'd you learn? What's the most important thing you learned? Well, I'm looking to expand my warehouse and. We didn't even know that. Well, I did this gap analysis. You get the picture. Active support, staff involvement, program coordination and details. You gotta do it right and you gotta have a quality program. It can't be run of the mill. It can't be a grade B. Proactive follow-up. Outcomes for the bank. We've seen this, we've seen this in every 
every bank. We saw it at Seafirst and Spades because I was there. We saw it at every bank we've worked with. Improved client communication, reduced portfolio risk, increased deposits, increased service utilization. You saw that from the Westpac graph. Do you want to do, if you want more information, go back and look at it again. Direct referrals. Those are things that banks pay a lot for. And we got customers to give them to us and pay to be there. Improved financial acumen, improved management efficiency. You saw all those things from the CIBC survey. Improved profitability and cash flow. If I own a, a small business or a closely held business, that's the most important asset in my world. If you can help me make it better, I'm going to remember you. I'm going to work with you. But it can't be lip service. It's got to be real. All right. I want to leave it there. It's got to be real. If you have any questions or you want to talk to me or have anything you want to clarify or any responses, thanks for joining me. For questions or comments, here's how you reach me. Lefevre at brs-seattle.com. There's my phone number. There's my website. I want to thank you. I want to thank the Graduate School of Banking for almost 30 years of opportunities to meet amazing people who help business owners all around the country. And I want to think that we're doing something to add to that process. So thank you very much. Have a great one. And like I say, give me a shout if you have questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And some great practical, relevant, and timely information once again uh, that you've presented today. So thank you for your time. And uh, again, this is just one of the four distinguished speaker series that we have and that's available to our students or sponsoring organizations and others that are out on our website. So uh, please feel free to view them all. Thanks again to our sponsors and have a great day.